Good day, Greater St. John. This is the day that the Lord has made, and it's a beautiful day at that. The Sunday school lesson is coming out of Deuteronomy chapter number 18, verses 15 through 22. And the title of our lesson is Prophet of Deliverance. Prophet of Deliverance. We are uh, in a new quarter. Last quarter, we dealt with call in the New Testament. And so this quarter, we're dealing with prophets faithful to God's covenant. Prophets faithful to God's covenant. Now, one would ask the question, what is a prophet? Of course, we know that a prophet in the biblical days, as well as today, is one that speaks for God, simply put. Uh, now, not just the ones who put pen to paper and write um, the revelation of God or their prophecies that we have today as the revelation of God. We've got the major prophets in the Bible, like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Jeremiah. And then you have the minor prophets like Hosea on to Malachi. But there were other prophets of the Bible. And we know that Moses is known as a prophet. Now, incidentally, prophets speak uh, or preachers, I should say, speak prophetically. They speak prophetically. They give God's written revelation. That's what uh, our pastor does. That's what men of God do, men of faith. Uh, but of course, also there are women of faith who simply as witnesses, they, they speak prophetically the words of God. We are in Deuteronomy chapter number 18. Deuteronomy chapter number 18 and Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible or the fifth book of Moses. Deuteronomy, it comes from a word that means second giving uh, of the law in particular. This is when Moses um, in his last days before the end of his life, um, he gives the second time the law to Israel, particularly the second generation of Israel before they were to uh, enter into the land. So there are a few things we want to consider. First of all, we want to talk about authority, authority, God given authority in verses 15 through 18 of chapter 18 of Deuteronomy. If you look at the text, the text says, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Now, we want to look at how God, Moses said, would raise up a prophet. Now, after the people um, hear about inheritance from Moses, of course, and and what they are not to do as they are to enter into the land, not being just like the uh, the people who are indwelling the land uh, at that time or inhabiting the land at that time. The nations that are in the land, uh, they are not to um, uh, perform the same practices of the nations of the land because they have a covenant relationship with God. And so Moses, of course, telling them what they are not to do. He talks about what God will do in the future. Now, notice what he says. The Lord thy God. Moses says this a lot. The Lord thy God. Remember the Lord Yahweh. That's his covenant name um, with regard to his relationship with Israel. But again, Moses says that he is their God. He is the God of the Hebrews as opposed to the idol gods uh, of the land um, that they were to possess or the false gods of the people they were to conquer. Remember the Canaanites and all of the other dwellers of the land at that time, they had their false gods. They made idol gods, but the children of Israel had their true God, which is again, Yahweh. Now, he says, or tells them 
what they or what he, their God, is to do. Once again, to raise up a prophet. And you see that word prophet in the King James Version uh, is capitalized. In fact, it is capitalized in other versions as well. That's significant. Uh, perhaps in the original Hebrew, it is not necessarily capitalized, but we have it here as capitalized, which means it is significant. The prophet would be reared up. The prophet would come from Moses's people, Israel, because the text says of thy brethren. But then the prophet would be raised among Moses's people. Now, whoever he is, again, he will come from Israel or he will be Hebrew. But notice the text also says that this prophet will be like unto Moses. OK, Moses says that the Lord would raise up a prophet like unto me. So he will be like Moses. OK, in many ways, he would speak the words of God. He would, of course, be a deliverer for the people of God. He would be called by God and authorized by God. Of course, he would have a spirit of humility because Moses himself uh, was humble. Now, again, Moses was that and he was all of that. Moses was not self-seeking. He didn't always uh, seek to please himself or he didn't always even say pleasant things. He said what God wanted him to say. Now, Moses gives the command regarding the prophet, basically, that the people should hearken unto him. That's what he says in the text, that the Lord would raise up unto them a prophet in the midst of them, of thy brethren, like unto me, Moses. But then he says, unto him ye should hearken. Parking, which says to us, that this prophet is to have authority, authority. Now, the word hearken means to hear intelligently. It means to listen with the intent on obeying what it said. So the prophet would have authority by which the people were to listen and obey. So this prophet would have authority. OK, the people must listen to him and obey what is said. Now, we know that Joshua succeeded Moses. He came after Moses. And then you would have other prophets uh, in, in the land to warn the people, uh, to admonish the people. But ultimately, we know from other scriptures that this prophecy refers to Jesus Christ. This prophecy refers to the Messiah. Okay. It is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. You can find uh, in the New Testament, references of people calling Jesus a prophet. But remember in John chapter number six, when Jesus uh, basically performed a miracle, uh, uh, multiplying bread and fish, the people deemed him to be that prophet that Moses spoke about. That's in John chapter number six, verse number 14. And then, of course, Moses and Stephen in the book of Acts, they, of course, attribute Moses's prophecy to the Christ, Jesus, the Christ. Now. Why is this? Why is God going to raise up a prophet in the midst of the people coming from Israel? Well, Again, this was requested, in a sense, by the people. If you look at verse number 16 through 18, the text says, According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb, which is another word for Sinai, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. Remember, this is actually what the people wanted. This is what they requested of the Lord. They wanted a mediator to go between them and God. They didn't want God to speak to them directly. Again, 
out of fear. They tremble at the base of the mountain. Okay, you can find that in Exodus chapter number 20, verse number 19. They're at the base of the mountain and they're trembling because of the voice of the Lord, him thundering and lightning and bringing fire because the Bible talks about how our God is a consuming fire. So Moses in Deuteronomy chapter number five, he recounts what uh, the parents of these individuals did. They wanted a mediator between them and God. Now, as New Testament believers, we are indwelt with the spirit of God. We know that God speaks to us. And uh, when we assemble uh, before God collectively to hear our God collectively, we hear God through the mouth of our pastor. OK, we hear the word of God through the mouth of our pastor. The pastor has the pastoral insight that we don't have. God wants to speak to people through the agency of the preacher or through the agency of a prophet, one who speaks for God. God uses people. He uses persons to convey his word. So the people of Israel at Mount Sinai, again, being afraid, they wanted Moses to speak to them from God. So Moses, he recounts this. If you look at verse 17, the text says, And the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth. So notice what Moses is telling the people, God told him. Okay, let me say it again. What Moses is relating to the people, God told him. God literally said that what they requested was good. What they requested was good. In fact, what they had done was good. Now, Moses is a prophet. In fact, the Bible talks about how God had a face-to-face -face relationship with Moses. But one would come after Moses who is considered greater than Moses. And I'm not necessarily talking about Joshua uh, at this point. Again, we're talking about ultimately the Christ, the Messiah who would come from the people of Israel. Okay. Now notice the word spoken by the prophet will be the very words of God himself. God says, I will put my words in his mouth. He has said that in regards to other prophets. Remember, he said that to Jeremiah, how he will put his words in the mouth of Jeremiah to speak unto the nations. You know, sometimes when people are saying things or trying to say things that they think we're trying to say, we often respond by saying, you're trying to put words in my mouth. And, and you can't put words in my mouth, but God himself can. God himself can. That's why in the prophetical books, when they spoke the words of God, these true prophets would uh, preface what they were saying by saying, thus saith the Lord because they were speaking the very words of God. They were speaking authoritatively on behalf of God. When Jesus was on the earth, he claimed to speak God's word. You can find that, of course, in his dealings with the Pharisees or the self-righteous religious rulers when he told them, of course, that he speaks God's word. But then, of course, there were occasions where he said that he speaks his own word. He would say, I speak my word again, just dealing with the fact that he is speaking authoritatively as the word of God made flesh. Now, again, they they deemed him to be that prophet that Moses spoke about. OK, but remember, Jesus is the revelation of God. He is the word made flesh. He reveals God 
in word and deed to the people. Okay. But he is also different than other prophets prior to him and even after him in that he spoke with ultimate authority. Remember in uh, his sermon on the Mount, when he spoke um, in Matthew chapter number seven, the Bible says the people responded in verses 28 and 29 by, by being astonished, saying that he speaks with authority and not as, as the scribe. And so again, we're talking about authority in the text, but then lastly, we're talking about accountability. Okay. Accountability, man's accountability. We see how God gives authority, but we also see how man is ultimately accountable for what he hears. If you look at verse number 19, verse number 19, it says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. The people course, were responsible for responding to the words of the prophet. Okay. The text says they were to hearken or listen, listen and obey, listen attentively once again with the intent on obeying what is said. So incidentally, you show you have listened to what is said when you obey what is said. We are accountable for what we hear. We, we are accountable for doing something with what we have heard. The text tells us, of course, uh, that God holds us accountable. He says he will require it of him. In other words, he will require the person's life. He holds the person's accountable for what they hear and how they respond to what they hear. Now, both pastors and people are responsible and accountable. Okay. He holds us accountable for listening and obeying the words given by the mouthpiece of God. These persons, these pastors, these prophets, the ones who speak for God, the very words on the or in the Holy Writ, on the pages of the Holy Writ. They are mouthpieces for God. They are agents of God. They're being used to convey God's word. And so we are responsible for doing something with what we have heard from the pulpit, okay? Now, if we're not careful, the truth be told, a lot of times we'll take what we've heard from the pulpit, we'll go home and we will forget all about it. We'll close our, Bi our Bible. We'll close our Bibles. And a lot of times, uh, some people will not open their Bible again until uh, the following Sunday. But God holds us accountable for what we have heard. Now, now, just because we read the Word of God and we study the Word of God, we even digest the Word of God, doesn't mean there is no need for the preacher or for the pastor or for the prophet in these New Testament times, okay? In these last days. Remember Ephesians chapter four, verse number 11 talks about the office of the prophets, office of evangelists, pastors and teachers. Um, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And yes, indeed, God is still giving these gifts to the church. He's still using the ones that he gave, okay? So don't turn off the preacher just because you're at home due to the pandemic. Don't turn off the pastors. Again, we know everybody has a word on YouTube. Um, I'm even on YouTube now. Uh, whereas I wasn't before or prior to the pandemic. But again, we know that you can read all of these things for yourself. You can read the word of God, but you still have a pastor to listen to. Now, he has authority. And to reject the words of the prophet 
that comes in the name of the Lord, who truly speaks for the Lord, is ultimately a rejection of the Lord himself. It is a rejection of God's word. And so uh, there are criterias that the people were to understand as it relates to who was a true prophet and who was a false prophet. Remember, they were to go into the land, the promised land, to rid the land of um, the nations that were um, bent on evil and wicked practices, trying to discern the will of their so-called false gods and, and uh, through divination and spiritism and necromancy and um, you know, speaking to dead spirits, uh, unfamiliar spirits or familiar spirits, um, wizardry and all of these things, sorcery. They had all of these things that they were guilty of in the land. And so the people of God were not to go into the land and imitate the practices of the wicked nations because the prophets of God gave the words and the will of God. And so they were to hearken unto the words of God given to the prophet once again. Okay. Now, the preacher or the prophet has the responsibility to truly speak for God and not on his own. We don't need self-appointed men and women to speak to us on behalf of God. But that's exactly what you had in that day. People who were self-appointed, who sent themselves. Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter number seven, how to discern between that prophet, which is true, and that wolf in sheep's clothing. Because the Bible tells us that there are consequences for speaking on behalf of God, but unauthorized by God. If you look at verse number 20, the text says, but the prophet which shall presume arrogantly come speaking a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak or that shall speak in the name of other gods. Even that prophet shall die. That, that's, that's a consequence, a deadly consequence. That's the consequence for uh, being self-appointed, coming in the name of God, but unauthorized by God or speaking in the name of other so-called gods. Death, God says here in the text. Now, why is that? Again, because they presume to speak for God, but God did not send them. Okay. They were sent by themselves or they speak for other gods. Again, true prophets gave the word of the Lord and the will of the Lord. So again, the people were to get that from the ones that God sent. They weren't not to imitate the practices of the wicked nations of the land. So again, this criteria uh, that God gives here in the text is pretty much a simple one. Uh, knowing whether a person is a true prophet or a false prophet. The criteria is simply this. If the prophecy or the word that they speak comes to pass. That person has been sent by God. Look at the text in verse number 21. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Verse 22, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously or arrogantly. Okay. Arrogantly, haughtily coming in the name of the Lord. 
when God did not send the individual. And again, this is opposite of Moses, remember, who is known as one who is humble. In fact, he is known as the meekest man on earth at that time. And so when a prophet comes and he is not like Moses, who is meek, who is humble, that person could be deemed a false prophet. If his lifestyle is characterized as one being arrogant, haughty, self-seeking, um, coming with great self-ambition, um, always speaking pleasant things, never speak, because there, remember, the Bible doesn't just give us things that are soothing and comforting and encouraging, but the Bible also gives us things that cut deep to the heart. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so if a person is always speaking what is pleasant or what makes the flesh feel good, it's a good indication that person is not sent by God. Because there are going to be some words that cut deep uh, when we are preaching or speaking the words of God. And then, of course, lifestyles or uh, the character of a person ought to be that of, of humility here. That's what, that's what the text tells us. So, again, if he comes arrogantly, presumptuously, that person has not been sent by God. Therefore, you shall not be afraid of him. That's what that's what the Lord, of course, um, wanted the people uh, of Israel to know. Now, again, uh, the same criteria that was used then is the same criteria that should be used today. And those of us, I, I have to remind myself uh, as one who speaks the words of God, being called by God, um, that I have to do just that, speak God's word and not come on my own accord. <clears throat> because ultimately, as, as preachers, we have to give an account for what we have said in the pulpit. In fact, James talks about how we are held to greater accountability in James chapter number three, verse number one. Um, so we have to we have to uh, take seriously what we do. Amen. So thank you so much. We look forward to ministering to you next time. Uh, until then, God bless you and God keep you.